<laughs> that lawnmower, I've never heard it before. Uh, you know, it's, it's like, there can't be much grass out there. He'll be done soon. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, how, how, how long can you mow the desert, right? You know? But the analogy is, you know, we can, we can place ourselves in any one of these positions, but let's say there's somebody, uh, there's a, a patient, that um, has an affliction, he has an illness, or he has a disease, let's call it his, a disease, and he comes in and uh, talks, to, sees a doctor, or a doctor approaches him, and he says that, um, he says, I have a, a, a disease, but we're not talking about disease, we're talking about dis-ease. Disease, as opposed to not being at ease. When somebody's in the present moment, for example, like we all were just doing with our meditation, hopefully we were all at ease and we noticed this presence and, and everything was fine. But somebody uh, approaches the doctor or he has a conversation with the doctor and says there's some disease and he, he asks what the uh, symptoms are. And the patient or this person says, well, I, um, I just feel kind of stressed out, you know, there's some stress in my life, and, and the doctor says, would you say it's kind of some suffering? He said, yeah, well, there's some suffering there, you know. Um, I don't feel complete all the time. Uh, sometimes I'm happy, sometimes there's sadness, sometimes there's depression. These different things come up for me. Um, he says, uh, the doctor says, okay, well, uh, let's find out what's going on here. You know, so he, he says, let me ask you a few questions. And he, you know, I guess you can kind of imagine that he has a, has a clipboard. Oh, we got one right here, actually. <laughs> he has a clipboard. And he, he's going to ask the, the patient some questions, you know. And uh, he says, you know, are there, uh, you know, is there any kind of uh, desire for things to be different in your life? And of course the patient says, well, yeah, you know, I'd like to have, uh, you know, be a little bit easier, you know, easier life, have more money maybe, and a uh, nicer home or a nicer location, you know, some place where they're not mowing the lawn all the time or something like that. What, and he said, and the doctor says, okay, well, uh, is there any fear in your life? Um, the patient says, well, not really, not, not much fear. The and the doctor asks him, do you have any fear of death? Oh, yeah, I have fear of death. Yeah, that could be a fear. You know, that's our, our biggest fear, right? <laughs> <laughs> and he's probably just emptying the, the bag <laughs> of the grass. <laughs> And so the, uh, he says, yeah, there's some fear. Um, okay, checks off the fear. Any anger? Yeah, there's a little bit of anger that I have with sometimes my, my children anger me or my partner angers me. I get a little bit angry, but mostly at traffic. That's when I'm usually more, the most angry. So he check, kind of checks that off and and uh, it kind of goes down the list, you know, is there um, any kind of, uh, any kind of doubt, you know, that you might have in your life? And uh, he says, well, you know, I, I, I kind of doubt that I can be free from uh, anxiety, you know, that little, little bit of anxiety I have, and I just think that's a part of life, you know, this... Um, this kind of you know living that I think I think it's just the way that that it that it is. So I kind of doubt that that can be eliminated. For example, and he says, "Okay, so there's some doubt there." And I said, "How about boredom?" And he said, "Well, yeah, yeah. There's some boredom." So this patient is realizing that once he kind of looks at this stuff and analyzes it, takes a like a, a deeper look at these things. He he sees these, these, they might be subtle, but he sees them there. 
he sees you know some some aspects of greed and some aspects of of um, anger and, and hatred and and then you know he, he's there's some delusion there because he's seeing it because the doctor's pointing out these things he's asking him specific questions and he's realizing that yeah there there are these things present in my life um, and before that, he maybe just felt like things weren't right for whatever reason. Um, so he had this dis, dis-ease about him. And um, so, so there was, um, there was this, uh, these symptoms. The doctor kind of pointed out the cause of these symptoms. And it kind of, you know, wrote them down on his clipboard, we could say. And so there is a, the, the prognosis is that there is definitely some, some unhappiness, there's some disease, there's some unsatisfactoriness. Um, pretty much uh, there's some suffering going on in, in, in person's life. And so the, that's the prognosis and then Prescription. You know, we're, remember, we're dealing with a doctor here. So we have the symptoms, the cause, the prognosis, and the prescription. The prescription, the doctor, you know, is sitting, sitting down with a patient and says, you know, we, the, the bad news is that there are some suffering, but we have good news. There is something we can do about this. And I'm going to prescribe you uh, eight things to take, to take care of this problem. And... Within these eight things, they, they kind of fall into some categories. And um, the categories are uh, w- wisdom, morality, and uh, practice that we want to fall in. So there's, there's things that we have to know and realize. There's things that we want to do, such as you know, take this prescription. And um, there's, some, there's some practices behind it, like continually doing it. We we don't we're not going to take one pill and be completely cured. We have to to stay with this regimen, and but we want to know exactly what we're doing and what we're do, dealing with. So the first thing that the doctor points out is that um, that there's there's some 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 thought behind us, some understanding, and the understanding primarily is that when we do something, there's a result behind it. And this can be pointed out with, with, with everything, every aspect um, of life. And everything that we, that we do, if we, don't, if we start something and don't follow through, there's a result. Um, you know, there's so many examples. I had two appointments to get my hair cut, for example. <laughs> And they fell through. So the result is I didn't get my hair cut. It's something very simple. Um, Ironically, I had two opportunities to go to India. Both of them fell through. I haven't been to India yet. The result is that I have not been to India. You know, no big thing. They can do it, take care of it later on. That's just one aspect. But what I'm talking about is is karma, what we call karma. And I don't often say the word karma because people go, oh, karma. You know, it's got that uh, that in, that that uh, meaning behind it, where um, oh, bad you know, bad karma. That's why this happened, or why, that's why that happened. But in reality, it's 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 true. It, and karma, cause and effect, answer a lot of questions for us as far as why to do um, certain things happen to certain people, and. It's very basic that there's, we perform an action and there's, after that action is done, there's, there's a result to it. That's why we pretty much do what we do, you know, because we, we th- think there's going to be a result. If we sit in, in quiet meditation, the result is, is that we have some clarity and, and some, some understanding and some happiness will, will re- result of that. If we go to work, Earn some money. The result is that we get a paycheck, and we have you know money that we can do things you know help other people with and do all sorts of other things with. 
And the result of a metta practice is that we have this uh, kind of a conditioning of the heart. We, we learn to understand and, and appreciate others at a, at a different level. And, and it goes on and on. So all we have to do is be aware uh, of, of this process, this um, cause and effect. And the, another part of this prescription was the understanding um, and the thinking process that's behind uh, loving kindness, behind compassion, and behind uh, renunciation or letting go. So if we have these beliefs and we have the, this, this uh, stickiness uh, and we have difficulty uh, letting go of things that we probably know that we should let go of, such as maybe, um, like I said, beliefs or relationships, um, ideas of how things should be, uh, and again, the list goes on and on. Uh, and even uh, some possessions. You know, when we walk into a room and the room feels cluttered, it's for a reason. It's not only in the mind, but, you know, it could be something in our environment that feels cluttered. And the same, but the same thing goes for our mind. If we're confused, if we have any kind of delusions, it's generally because there has to be something that has to, that should fall away, that we should allow to fall away. And it's true with um, being compassionate towards other people, too, and compassionate towards ourselves, and being loving towards ourselves, um, talking about loving kindness, and loving towards other people. Everybody, everybody that we meet, even our enemies, and those that we don't necessarily agree with, people that we, um, we feel are a problem, people in our lives, you know, this is just the mind. You know, all of this is mind stuff. And the um, skillful understanding and skillful thoughts or skillful thinking is uh, a big part of this prescription. And it's really pointing to that uh, any kind of problems or difficulties that we have are, are really up to us. So this the stuff is a choice. Everything is a choice that we have. And, you know, things do happen in life, but we have a choice of how we react to it. If there's an adversity or something that we feel is a problem or a difficulty that comes up to us, how do we look at that? I mean, do we look at it as a problem or a difficulty? We don't have to. It's really up to us. It's a choice. I had a conversation with somebody um, just last week, and he was just, he realized, he just came to a realization that everything that he's ever done was a choice. He'd been smoking all of his life, and he, was, he said that when I have a, he said that just to have the realization that whenever I have a cigarette, it's a choice. It's a choice that I'm making at that moment. And that can be a huge discovery for people. You know, everything is a choice. That's why we are here right now, because it's a choice. We made a, cho uh, you know, honest dis you know, decision whether we were going to be coming, coming here this morning, and we followed through. Even if it was very subtle, even if it was just, well, I've done this for seven weeks, I'm going to just continue doing it. Um, I had one person, <laughs> one person this morning had to drop off something. He said, I'm going to drop off that book that, that you loaned me. I'll put it in your mailbox this morning. And I said, why don't you um, drop it off in class this morning? Why don't you give it to me in class? And then there was a text a little while later. I, I guess I won't be going to class um, because he was signed up for the, he's a part of this group. Uh, no names, of course, but, um, and he was kind of following the habit of not, you know, coming to the, coming to the morning class, where everybody here was following the habit of coming to the class. So a part of this prescription is skillful understanding, 
and skillful thought. Uh, the other part of this prescription is more of a um, more of a morality kind of aspect and a skillful speech. And these are things that remember. This is the doctor talking to the patient. So when we talk, the when we use these words, this is really a cu- uh, accumulation of what is going on in our mind. This is our our relation to those outside. And we should be very, very careful with what, how we use our, our words and how we speak. You know, is it truthful? Is it kind? Is it soft? Uh, or is it harsh? You know, is it? Uh, are are we aware that our words can be used as weapons? Are we aware that they can be used in in a very profound way? You know, when, um, for example, when President Obama was speaking, people listened to him when he was running for president. Oh, they still do listen to him. Very good speaker. You know, if, if, when people would think of Pres- uh, Obama before he was even president, they would think in terms of how eloquently he speaks. It was eloquent enough to get him elected, you know, as president. Very, you know, very clear speech. And, you know, this is something that I'm always working at. I know that I, I need a lot of work in that area. Um, but to be uh, present of that and to be aware of how we speak and think in terms of when we speak to a child, you know, that child is wide, wide, wide eared open, you know, wide eyed open. and ready to take in every word that you say and to repeat it to everybody out there, maybe for the rest of their life. And so we have to be very careful what we say to that child. But the same is true with everybody in our lives. We we should be very careful of the words we use and how we use them. Skillful speech, you know, refraining from lying, refraining from harsh speech, refraining from manipulating, Refraining from uh, using um, uh, negative speech, such, such as swearing, and uh, particularly lying, not telling the truth. Skillful speech. Skillful action is the other part of the prescription, the actions that we use. And in Buddhism, we look at precepts as far as actions go. And part of it is the speech. But also part of it is to refrain from using our body in in negative ways, such as harming or killing. Um, Refraining from uh, overindulgence of intoxicants or using drugs in a certain way that they can harm us or encouraging other people to use them in a certain way. And um, refraining from... uh, negative you know, sexual misconduct, generally where there's a, a third person involved that could get harmed or something like this. And these are, these are called, the, these are precepts. Um, and they include stealing as well, taking what is not ours. But as lay people, we have five precepts. So a monk will have 110 or something like that. Um, and they, they all have to do with the actions that we we do, body, speech, and mind. And so, skillful speech, skillful action, and skillful livelihood. Livelihood is our jobs, is our work. Remember, these are prescriptions from the doctor. Look look at what we do for our work. Do we, first of all, do we like our job? Does it cause any stress for us? Do we hate walking into that, that, that work that we do? Or do we like it? And if we do like it, why do we like it? And if we don't like it, why don't we like it? Really take a look at that. But does it does it harm anybody? You know, are we manufacturing weapons? You know, are we doing? Are we working in um, in a uh, in a area of business that we that is hurting people? That is is illegal or um, not benefiting others? If we're, if we're doing something in work that benefits other people 
and makes us feel good, then we're exactly where we should be. And we all have done uh, really difficult, hard jobs where we didn't even get paid anything. And that tells us something. That, that tells us that's probably something that we should be looking at as far as what we should be doing you know, for our livelihood. Whether, um, you know, if, if you do what you love and the money will follow is, is pretty true, but it's not always true. But we should be doing what we love because it's benefiting ourselves and it's probably benefiting other people. Skillful livelihood. And these are the, the areas of, um, of morality, part of the prescription. The other area is skillful, well, it's, it's our practice. And we, us in the West, really embrace the practices that go along with the, the practice of, of uh, Buddhism. That's why we're here. That's why most of us are here. And the, very, the first one is skillful effort. And it's very, skillful effort is very interesting because it, it has to do with um, doing, doing away with negative mind states. And first of all, preventing them from coming up and then keeping them at bay, negative mind states. But it also has to do with cultivating positive mind states and maintaining them. And whenever uh, we look at in that area, that prescription, we should be looking at the five hindrances and to really understand the negative states that can come up for us. It's just, these are just like categories, but they're, they are basically what cause, um, can cause problems for us. And the wonderful thing about it is these, once these negative mind states, these hindrances are spotted and seen and understood on an intellectual level, they become choices for us. Because we know that when we meditate, for example, on a very basic level, even when we're not in meditation, when we're concentrated on something, these hindrances are at bay. They might be temporary, but they're, they're at bay. They're, they're not there. So we are exchanging the negative mind states for positive mind states. You know, when these, when these negative mind states fall away, what comes up is, is happiness and blissfulness, and equanimity, compassion, loving friendliness, loving kindness. And it all happens automatically. And a lot of it is just being able to recognize these, these hindrances, these negative mind states. A very important part of our prescription, you know, from the doctor. Remember, we can be the patient, and we can be the doctor, and we could, we could be any one of these roles, right? So, and then, so we have skillful effort, and then skillful mindfulness is another area. The skillful mindfulness is, you know, a big part of what brought us here um, eight weeks ago, or seven weeks ago, or whenever, you know, whatever, however we want to look at it. Um, to be mindful uh, means to, to see all of this and be part of it, a big part of it is memory, Remi reminding ourselves that you know, we want to understand all of this and look at it at such an extent that we understand that we don't have to be judgmental, we don't have to have this commentary about what is right or what is wrong going on. Uh, we don't have to have all this you know, decision of, uh, you know, is this person right or is this person wrong or is this good or bad, that kind of thing. And we all, um, I think all, everybody here has a pretty good grasp of what mindfulness is all about. And it's, it, it's, it gets hard to define in just a couple of words. It's take, it takes like an eight-week class to really get an understanding or a definition of what mindfulness is. But it's a very huge part of the practice. And before mindfulness uh, came about um, and 
most people would agree that it was really the Buddha that pointed out what sati or what mindfulness is, um, and to encourage that and to um, to generate that that ability to be mindful. And before that came about was this other part of this prescription, which is concentration. Concentration is key uh, in the area of you know bring our like we did a little while ago in our meditation, bringing our attention to the breath and, and noticing that presence that's there. Um, you know, a very, very simple practice, but when it's controlled more and more and more and more, we can use it to a greater extent, uh, you know, even a greater and greater and greater extent to be able to to use this concentration for mindfulness to be able to use it for virtually anything in our lives that we want to use it for, whether it's memorization or to um, bring ourselves into these states of bliss and joy. We talked about concentration uh, last week in, in the area of, of uh, sustained thought and applied thought and um, joy and blissfulness and and uh, this sustained attention um, how these factors when they're when they're uh, present there are no hindrances so everything is in conjunction with each other so when there's our when there's hindrances we can't be concentrated when we're, when, when we're concentrated there are no hindrances and there's a little bit of overshadows and things that happen, you know, in this whole process. But this is the primary area that we can be looking at. And so the the whole thing, uh, you know, we have this um, we have these symptoms and we have these cause causes, prognosis, and prescription. This prescription. It, it, what the Buddha told us is the, the, the way to get beyond this, this disease, dis-ease that we have is the Eightfold Path. And that's what I just outlined. Skillful understanding, skillful thought, skillful speech, skillful action, skillful livelihood, skillful effort, skillful mindfulness, and skillful concentration. That's the Eightfold Path. This, the... Um, the uh, symptoms, cause, prognosis, and prescription, that's the Four Noble Truths. That's the very first teaching of the Buddha. 